All right, the meeting is live. What's wrong? Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, June 10th, uh, 2020. It's about one o'clock. I'm Chauncey Goss, uh, Chairman of the Governing Board of the South Florida Water Management District. I'm going to call our Governing Board workshop to order. We appreciate everyone joining us for this public meeting. A few months ago, the board requested from staff a workshop that we were going to focus on district real estate and district land management activities. So we're eager to hear from the presenters today. The purpose of the meeting is to provide an overview of the district's real estate leasing and land management activities. Uh, the workshop session is informative in nature, and we're not going to be making any final decisions as a governing board today. Uh, members of the public, if you wish to address the board, you can use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. You're going to be called on to speak during the public comment part of this meeting. If members of the public are having any trouble and need help, please go to the website sfwmd.gov and click the Ask Us button at the top of the page. If you're using your cell phone and you'd like to comment, please press star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute or unmute. And board members, you can raise your hand at any time during the meeting and I'll acknowledge you when you have a question. Uh, Mr. Martinez, if you're there, I'd love to ask you to lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and I'd ask everyone to unmute before we do. I pledge allegiance to, to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. America. to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Amazing. So thank you very much, Mr. Martinez. I look forward to being able to do this in a room together um, rather than um, remotely. I'd ask you all to remute your microphones as we uh, move forward. And now we're going to turn the meeting over to uh, Stephen Collins. He's the director of real estate and land management for the district. Uh, Mr. Collins. Good afternoon, Chairman Goss and governing board members. Thank you for your time today. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. As Chairman Goss mentioned, we're going to talk about real estate and land management today. And we're breaking it into essentially two pieces. I'll speak first regarding the real estate portion of it. And then I'm gonna ask Rory Feeney, Bureau Chief Land Resources to speak about land management. And then of course, we'll be available for questions and answers.
Our discussion topics for real estate will be real estate roles and responsibilities, and then we'll touch on real estate by the numbers. One of the primary roles of real estate at the Water Management District is acquisition of real estate. As you see, acquisition is a multi-step process. In site selection, we work with operations, Everglades Policy Group, as well as other divisions on proper site selection. Our ability, our ability to identify real estate opportunities and pitfall, pitfalls from a high level aids in proper site selection. Title research. We conduct on average over 600 title searches and certifications each year, although not all of them are related to acquisitions. Our ability to identify easements, encumbrances, and objectionable clouds in a title help the agency to avoid acquiring flawed properties from a title or project perspective. An example of this might be an underground pipeline on a site being considered for a reservoir, which might not be readily observable in the field, but would show up in a title search as an easement. Appraisal review. All SERP projects acquisitions over a million dollars require two appraisals plus a critical review and selection of the appraisal that is most representative of the value. Real estate hires appraisers off the state's approved appraiser list to do value estimates and then conducts the critical research review and selection. We average 20 to 25 appraisal assignments per year, but some of them can encompass as many as, one single assignment can encompass as many as 100 parcels. A good example of that would be the C-111 project that was approved by the governing board in June of 2019. That was one single appraisal assignment that encompassed 61 unique parcels. Environmental. Real estate has environmental professionals on staff who conduct phase one desktop audits of sites. If additional investigations require, real estate works with environmental service contractors to obtain needed assessments and testing. Negotiation and contract preparation. Real estate specialists, acquisition specialists, negotiate the terms and conditions of a purchase, then prepare a draft contract for the Office of Counsel to review and approve. Funding. Real estate works closely with budget to identify funding from various sources, whether it be surplus ad valorem or state appropriation, and submits appropriate documentation to DEP's ecosystem project office when state funds are needed. And finally, closing. Closing of large acquisitions are typically handled by external title companies and law firms. Smaller acquisitions are typically handled by our own experienced staff. An example of uh, a closing handled by our own staff is the fact that closings that you approved in August of 2019. Another critical role we serve is the role of leasing. All leasing is done in accordance with district policy 140.85. Identification of lands occurs through the interim use assessment, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment, that's conducted by both staff, real estate, and land resources. Potential use will be covered in an interim use assessment. Bid development, we prepare bid packages and specs, minimum bids, site paths, and sample leases. Lease preparation. We complete leases based on the success, successful bidder with terms dependent on site location, condition, and planned use in a project or as a conservation lands. Lease execution. We prepare governing board materials and submit for governing board approval of all leases. And finally, lease administration. We prepare and submit invoices, collect rent, coordinate lease performance reviews, confirm payment of taxes, maintain correspondence and manage deposits. And we maintain all real estate records as it relates to leases. Interim use. Land acquired prior to use in a project is evaluated for interim use opportunities. Considerations. In an interim use compatibility analysis, we take a project first approach that considers the amount of time that the land will be available along with any inputs needed, things like fertilizers, fencing, and other investments needed to make the use viable, which is compared to the intended project use for compatibility. In site suitability, we look at all the different potential opportunities that the site could be used for that are once again compatible with the long-term plan for the site. District benefits. We consider the cost of the, to the district of managing this property as well as the potential 
and Glades, Henry, Okeechobee, and Highlands County for the district to have to make PILT payments or payment in lieu of taxes. And we also look at being able to keep the, keep the property on the tax rolls by having it in an interim use like agriculture. Also, by keeping, it, by keeping it in use, we avoid the potential wetland mitigation requirements if the land ends up lying fallow for five years and revegetates as a wetland. Finally, we look at the economic viability. Does this interim use make economic sense for the district as well as for the lessee? And I'd like to go through a couple of examples of interim uses that currently exist at the district. The C23, C24 reservoirs in STA are currently being leased for cattle grazing instead of continuing as citrus production leases after acquisition. The passive use for cattle grazing prevented continued use of non-desirable chemicals typically used in citrus groves. It keeps the land in the tax rolls benefiting the local government. It provides a mean to control exotic plants pending project construction. The lease payments reduce the cost of district land management. Having a lessee on site provides security and reduces illegal dumping. And the district requires BMPs for cattle that prevent use of harmful chemicals and fertilizers during the lease term. Another example I'd like to review with you is the EAA reservoir, which, which was continuing in sugarcane production. This is a situation where it avoids wetland mitigation requirement at time of project construction on lands historically converted from wetlands to ag use from being automatically reclassified as wetlands if not in farm, farm production for five years prior to obtaining the permits for construction. It also utilizes local farm labor benefiting the local economy. And the income that we derive from this lease we use to treat other properties. In this case, the Loxahatchee Refuge Wildlife Ex Exotic Plant Control. Implementation of acceptable interim use is accomplished through the leasing program. Leasing is governed by District Policy 140-85 and Florida Statute 373-093. A lease must be publicly advertised for three successive weeks, not less than 30 or more than 90 days prior to the date of board execution. It typically must be competitively bid. There are exceptions to bidding, including reservations granted as part of a sale. In other words, we sell, we buy a property from uh, an entity and they reserve the right to farm it for a year or two or whatever, continue their operations for a year or two. That's considered a reservation and that's not required to be competitively bid. Leases to government agencies are not required to be publicly competitively bid. And other situations as determined by the board, not warranting a bid such as one, only, one interested party only. Appraisal, for a minimum bid determination, the rent, if the rent is estimated to be over $2,500 per year, the property must be appraised. The initial term is not to exceed 10 years on conservation lands and five years on project lands. Minimum bid must be at least 75% of the appraised value Annual rent adjustments, year one is the bid amount. Years two through five is the annual increase in CPI or some other relevant index. And leases in year six is based on an updated appraisal. We collect a deposit equal to the first year's rent and one year of property taxes. And termination clause, standard termination clause of 180 days notice for convenience is typical. Cattle grazing leases are a little bit different. The cattle grazing lease, we, have, we developed a formula in conjunction with the cattlemen's industry that fluctuates up and down based on the market price for cows, for cattle. So that when markets are flush and the market's doing well, we, we collect increased rent. And when the market dips, our, our rent goes down, but it gives the ability to the cattlemen to, to survive and not suffer such a penalty from our, our rent. Rent is based on five factors related to the beef cattle industry. First is the USDA National Beef Cattle Sales Report for the Southeast US, which gives the price for a typical animal, which is considered to be 550 pounds. The number of animal units that the site is suited for, that's our animal, animal units. And the land rent factor, which is calculated based on the amount that was bid by the cattlemen when they initially lease the property.
And in terms of a summary of our leasing, this is a, this is a snapshot of uh, the leases in existence at the district. As you can see, the majority of our leases are in cattle grazing. Cattle grazing leases are some of the most passive of the district land uses that, that help to manage vegetation, save district management costs, place land back on the tax rolls. Now we're going to talk a little bit about sales. Surplus determinations can be as a result of internally identified properties or an external request. Internal surplus de determinations are based on detailed due diligence process, a fully vetted through all district divisions for assessment prior to board approval. An appraisal is required with a review to comply with section 373.089 of Florida statute which states the property shall be sold for the highest price obtainable, but not less than appraised value. Properties at the district are sold through a sealed bid process. So that's the, creates the requirement for bid development. Marketing, our, we, put a, our, we post a bid package on our real estate page on the district website, and we have, do an email blast to a, a list of over a thousand contacts. Marketing, we conduct a site visit and answer questions and then closing once the, the successful bidders are identified and the contract is signed. Current, in order to have a property determined surplus, it's gotta be approved by the board. And they, okay, it can only be considered surplus when they're not required for present or future works of the district. They're not required for present or future recreational development. They have no apparent present or future utility in the district's land management program, or they've been declared surplus by the board. In the case of, we talked a little bit about an internal surplus determination. In the case of an external surplus determination, we require the following. We require the external requester to make application, including a $1,000 application fee. It must include a legal description and sketch of the property, a statement of the proposed use for the development of the land, a statement evidencing that the proposed sale or exchange is not contrary to the public interest and any other information that's deemed necessary to evaluate the request. Currently, the district has 10 properties that have been approved by the previous governing board for surplus. They total about 900 acres and have an appraised value of just over $9 million. It would be my intent and based on my discussions with Drew that before we would move any of these properties to a sales status that we would take them back to the governing board for their consideration and reapproval. Operational support. This is not the fun part of the business, but yet in the same breath, it can be the most fun part of our business. First thing we do is identification of real estate rights. I've received emails from district personnel of a picture of a piece of property taken from a helicopter with the question, do we own this property? That, that's always an intriguing assignment and we usually are able to identify the, the rights we have, if any, in the property. The real estate division retains an experienced staff and resources to research and identify any real estate any real estate issues. We review on average 500 right-of-way permits per year to verify that the requested permit for use allowed based on our rights in the property. By way of example, a, a for-profit commercial operation is not acceptable on fee-owned right-of-way. As previously mentioned, we conduct over 600,000 600 title searches per year, not only for acquisition, but also to support right-of-way enforcement, vegetation management, and construction projects. We provide support to the Office of Council. Under an environmental incidents report, we handle environmental incidents such as contamination by prior landowners, current contractors, and third parties. We maintain all data for the district owned real estate and interests to DEP's database or state owned lands. We provide temporary access to other governments, agencies, or private parties when needed. 
and we prepare the annual to chapter 6A of the South Florida Environmental Report for all real estate acquisitions, dispositions, identified project land needs for certain restoration projects. The importance of being in the SFER and being accurate in the SFER is to be available, be eligible for state funding. It has to be approved in the, uh, in the annual work plan. And we also have some unique skills in our division. Uh, and I believe it was in January, we celebrated Marcy Zender's 30 year anniversary with the company. And as it was mentioned, Marcy has a unique skill of finding long lost landowners. So if we identify a land gap and you own the land and the district needs it, Marcy will find you. Real estate by the numbers. The district owns in fee 803,594 acres. What does fee mean? Fee is short for fee simple interest, which means we own the property. Acres held in easement, 694,153 acres. What's an easement? An easement is a right to use land owned by someone else for a specified purpose. Many, if not most of our easements are flowage easements. So the total land that the district has control over is of just under a million and a half acres. Focusing on the land that we own where we have the most control, you see how it's broken down between the various uses. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rory to talk about how our land management process works. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, my name is Rory Feeney. I am the Land Resources Bureau Chief here at the South Florida Water Management District. I'm pleased to be here, virtually at least, <laughs> to provide you an overview of the Land Resources Bureau. The Bureau's goal is to ensure, maintain, and protect the availability, usability, and sustainability of the unique land and water resources of South Florida. We perform land man management functions over 1,240,000 acres of land, 430,000 acres of lakes, and 2,600 miles of canals and levees. Under the direction of the Real Estate and Land Management Division, the Land Resources Bureau is separated into two unique but equally important sections. Let's begin with the vegetation management section. Our focus under this section is to ensure that the region's water resources and flood control system function without obstruction by nuisance vegetation, and that your conservation lands are protected from impacts from invasive exotic species as well as provide maximum sustained water quality performance through the proper management of stormwater treatment areas. With that, let's dive deeper into the responsibilities of each organizational unit of the vegetation management section. As I stated before, our work spans across more than 2,000 miles of canals and levees, including work such as hazardous tree and debris removal, STA management, invasive plant management, and the infamous Python elimination program. We have dedicated scientists and support staff that work tirelessly throughout the 16 counties. Controlling invasive species is, the most, is an important success indicator of the agency's ecosystem restoration effort. The Land Resources Bureau actively manages over 70 priority plant species and six priority invasive animal species. Here we have some examples of impacts to the environment from invasive plants. You can see on the photo on the left, an aquatic plant called Rotala, which is um, an ornamental plant used in the aquarium industry, and it's impacted the conveyance of one of our canals. The photo on the right is in Water Conservation Area 1, also known as the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. This picture shows a tree island severely impacted by the invasive fern called Ligodium. Invasive plants have a profound impact on our environment. They can turn a highly diverse ecosystem into a monoculture, unusable by wildlife in just a few years. The basic tenant to manage these invasive plants is a systematic use of integrated pest management, or IPM. IPM utilizes several tools categorized as the following. Mechanical control, such as cutting, chopping, and mulching. Herbicide control, 
cultural tools such as prescribed burning and rehydration of an area to either promote native growth or inhibit expa invasive expansion. Biological control using natural predators and targeted outreach to empower the public to become better stewards of their land. This slide shows how we use IPM to manage invasive Malaleuca trees. Typically, initial treatment of Malaleuca is conducted by ground crews or air, depending on the level of infestation, followed by prescribed burning several months later to further reduce the biomass, at which point biocontrol can eat new budding growth. And then lastly, hand pulling or low level herbicide treatment by ground crews. A little bit more on how biocontrol works. Through an extensive biological screening process, which sometimes takes nearly a decade, a natural predator of an invasive plant is reintroduced to its host. The biocontrol agent, agent is only selected if it eats a targeted species and nothing else. This slide shows an experiment where biocontrol agents were released to a site with an abundance of juvenile Malaleuca. The photo on the left shows the location of where the biocontrol agents were excluded using insecticides. And the photo on the right, where the bugs were left to do their job, left untouched to do what they needed to do. The biocontrol agent essentially slows the growth by eating the budding tips of Malaleuca. And while these agents won't necessarily eradicate a species, they assist us around the clock to increase the time between follow-up treatments and help us use less herbicide. I would like to point out that the district is proud to be a part of the partnership with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Army Corps of Engineers in the construction and ongoing development of the biocontrol facility in Davie, which happens to be the first SERP project completed. You will hear me use the term maintenance control a lot today. Maintenance control is the coordinated and consistent management of invasive plants in order to maintain the plant population at low levels. The results of maintenance control are less herbicide use on a per acre basis, lower cost to manage, lower ecosystem disturbance from management activity, improved habitat condition, and less reliance on aerial and high volume ground applications of herbicide. The photo on the top shows an area of dense Melaleuca. It's practically a, a monoculture there. Um, and the photo below that is an area under maintenance control in water conservation area three. Now you can still see some small Melaleuca trees there um, but that can be either spot treated with very little amounts of herbicide or simply pulled out by hand. Here's an example of maintenance control from a cost and herbicide point of view. This slide compares data between water conservation area one, which is currently not under maintenance control, and water conservation area three, which is currently under maintenance control. You can see that in Fiscal year 19, that's where this data is, is taken from. Fiscal year 19, we covered approximately 20,000 acres of uh, water conservation area one and spent $40 per acre doing that type of work. While it's slow, we can go there and we're gonna eventually get that area into maintenance control. Water conservation area three is currently under maintenance control and we're able to move a lot faster and we covered over 100,000 acres in fiscal year 19 and that only cost us 51 cents an acre. By using invasive plant management to reach maintenance control, the district has seen a substantial reduction of herbicide use as shown in this graph between year 2010 and 2019. While the district does have a well-running IPM program, we recognize the need to continue to look for ways to further reduce our dependency on herbicides. Our team will continue the expansion of successful strategies and use adaptive management with the current tools in our toolbox. At the same time, we are developing new strategies to enhance our vegetation management, including herbicide rate reductions, evaluation of new innovations in herbicide, evaluations of new technologies in aquatic plant harvesters, utilizing existing and additional weed barriers in key areas to collect aquatic plants for mechanical removal and improve program oversight by district staff and contractors. Taking the mantra of IPM and maintenance control to the aquatic system, the district uses grass carp in our canals 
as well as selective herbicides labeled for aquatic use and mechanical control in key areas where water levels and vegetation densities allow. It's important to know that grass carp, also called triploid carp, are sterile and unable to reproduce. These herbivores work around the clock eating aquatic vegetation and are carefully deployed in areas that can benefit from this type of control measure. And here's a situation that we're trying to avoid. Um, this picture shows a vegetative mat right there that flowed from an adjacent landowner and literally took out that farmer's bridge right there. It's a pile supported structure. And once that heavy vegetation hit those piles, it knocked it out. And as you can see on the photo on the right, the bridge gave out. Had this been a district managed canal, the vegetation would probably not have been uh, allowed to get to that level and, and scooped out of the canal. That just shows you the, the force of vegetation. Moving on to natural areas vegetation management. One of the keystone projects that we have the responsibility to manage is the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge and Water Conservation Area 1. Under a license agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the district receives federal funding of $2 million a year to restore the habitat that has been overtaken by Ligodium and Melaleuca. Other important projects include Picayune Strand Restoration, Kissimmee River Restoration, and several projects in Miami-Dade. So you may be asking yourself, are these strategies working? Those attending today, listening in, um, that lived around Lake Okeechobee back in the 1980s and 90s, remember the Melaleuca Forest and the Moorhaven Marsh. Using integrated pest management, that same area has been transformed back to a productive wetland. Here's another vantage point of Moorhaven Marsh before and after maintenance control. Another maintenance control success story is in Miami-Dade County. These are time-lapse phot uh, photographs from the Pensuco mitigation area east of Chrome Avenue. Initial treatment began back in 1998. Using IPM consistently, you can clearly see the improvements over time. Maintenance control was achieved in about six years. And over the following years, the native plant communities really rebounded. As you can see, moving down those pictures in the very bottom, uh, you can see sawgrass and iliacris out to the horizon. It's absolutely beautiful out there. The Land Resources Bureau takes its knowledge to the stormwater treatment areas as well. These massive constructed wetlands require constant site management through plantings, conversions of wetlands species, drawdowns, and spraying services. The SDA vegetative community is made of emergent and submerged aquatic vegetation. Examples of emergent vegetation, or EAV, are cattail, pickerel weed, and bulrush. EAV helps to reestablish stable soils that would otherwise be easily resuspended. EAV helps to redirect flows to mitigate short circuiting. They help with nutrient uptake. They help stabilize submerged aquatic vegetation and prevent plants from piling up in one area. And of course, they increase plant biodiversity. Examples of SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, are Southern Naiad and Kara. These plants provide water column nutrient uptake. They increase biodiversity. And around the, around the year, uh, throughout the year, staff identify key areas that are in need of repair and establish new SAV beds that have been either damaged or predated by a resident fauna. It's important to remember that SDAs are adaptively managed. The SDAs of today are far different from 20 years ago. The old school thought was to just have cattails in the northern end of the STA and hydrilla on the southern end. Now we have learned through extensive research that STAs perform much better at removing phosphorus with a mixed marsh design made up of thalia, bulrush, cara, pickerel weed, and many other species. So on to a different organizational unit of the Bureau, canal and levee management. Removing hazardous and exotic trees from the district right-of-ways reduces risk to critical infrastructure, adjacent properties, facilitates access, and ensures maximal, convey maximum can canal of conveyance. We do this activity primarily by way of mechanical means, as depicted in the photos on the slide. Our experienced contractors have the expertise and equipment to operate in a variety of conditions. 
While most of our activity is land-based, we can also remove hazardous trees and debris from deep canals to natural systems and creeks with water depths of less than three feet. The result of this work provides flood protection and proper water conveyance to more than 2,000 miles of canals. An example of this work can be seen here in Miami-Dade County in the C-100A Canal. The before picture on the left shows invasive Brazilian peppers impacting access, conveyance, and causing long-term risk associated with storm activity. The photo on the right just a few months later shows the end product of the work done by one of our contractors. The result is a properly maintained conveyance system capable of moving water during the most critical times. And we're doing this important work year round to avoid scenarios like this after Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Uh, those are all Australian pine trees that were toppled into our canal system, restricting water flow and making access extremely difficult. The uh, cost, by the way, can be four times higher removing those trees after a storm event compared to the uh, amount um, it would cost had we done that uh, ahead of time. So an ounce of preventive measure goes a long way in our program. The vegetation management section also has a responsibility to manage invasive animal populations on district land. Our spotlight program is the Python Elimination Program. Under Governor DeSantis' support, both the District and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission have taken this program to new levels. Through an extensive collaboration process over the last nine months, the state agencies have aligned programs and have doubled their removal efforts. Since the beginning of the Python Elimination Program in 2017, Python removal has increased dramatically. In some locations, removal has increased by more than 200%. Um, that figure right here, this graph, um, you'll have to excuse me, is, needs to be updated. The, uh, the latest numbers are over 4,700 pythons removed over the last three, three years since the beginning of the uh, Python Program. And the district has the district program alone has removed almost 3,000 snakes, and that equates to more than 18,000 feet of snakes if you ride them end to end. Our program area has expanded dramatically uh, after Governor DeSantis directed the state agencies to increase their efforts. Here uh, is a slide showing the Python elimination program area back in 2019. And here is where it is now. As of May 2020, district contractors uh, can now remove pythons from across six counties, including Everglades National Park, Big Cypress National Preserve, and Biscayne Bay National Park. With the additional funding supported by the district, we have several requests for proposals and contracts for advancing technology and innovations, including radio telemetry of juvenile snakes, canine detection, environmental DNA sampling, which is the uh, detection, which detects the presence or absence of pythons in water or soil. And we're also looking into the rapidly changing world of spectral imagery, which gives us the ability to detect pythons hiding in the environment day or night. So that was the vegetation management section. Let's talk about our other side of the bureau called land stewardship. The land stewardship section is responsible for managing the district's land resources to restore and maintain the environmental value and function of conservation lands and to manage interim project lands in a cost-effective manner until such time as a project is ready to go to construction. I'll dive into those details over the coming slides. The land stewardship section is staffed by wild, wildlife biologists, recreational specialists, highly skilled land management technicians, and administrative staff. The land stewardship section manages approximately 410,346 acres and another 352,815 acres are managed at a no cost to the district by other government entities throughout uh, through cooperative agreements. Those properties include water conservation areas, conservation lands established as state or county parks, and joint acquisitions between state and the district where a state agency was already identified as a lead agency prior to that acquisition. I'd like to 
shift gears and talk about our, one of our core functions. First off is prescribed burning, one of our most cost-effective and ecologically important land management activities. Some basics why we put fire on the ground in the lightning capital of the country. Many Florida upland ecosystems are dependent upon a natural fire cycle. Pine flatwoods, for example, need frequent burns to maintain an open plant community of pines, grasses, and herbs. If you look at the photo uh, from the pine flatwoods of Corbett Wildlife Management Area here at the bottom, you can see that the location, the perspective is the same. The difference is that in a six year time period, several, several prescribed burns were conducted by highly trained land managers. This in turn has restored ecological integrity, controlled woody vegetation, reduced fuel loading, helped control exotic plant growth by opening the understory and allowing a more efficient use of herbicides, as well as protecting endangered species such as the red cockaded woodpecker. Each plant community has its own preferred burn frequency, but on average, we try to burn on a rotation of once every three to five years with a minimum acreage of 16,000 acres burned per year. This year, we have burned 20,724 acres on our conservation lands, plus an additional 20,200 acres during the dry season on Lake Okeechobee. That's over 40,000 acres, and I, I do believe that's a historic milestone for the district. One of the more interesting ways we put fire in the ground is by way of helicopter. Using a piece of equipment called an aerial ignition device, we can safely and cost effectively conduct prescribed fires over hundreds and sometimes thousands of acres. This device uses ping pong balls made of potassium permanganate, which get injected with antifreeze through the launcher depicted on the left, pointing at it right there. This combination creates an exothermic reaction and by the time those balls reach the ground, they are on fire and in turn create a small spot fire, as you can see here in the lower right hand corner. Uh, that's an aerial burn that was done at Dupuy back in 2011. Some of our other land management functions include performing threatened and endangered species monitoring in the STAs relocating species, listed species such as the gopher tortoise from district construction sites, managing an FWC permitted gopher tortoise recipient site for internal agency use, and conducting, re conducting and reporting on various wildlife investigations such as bird die-offs and manatee mortalities around our locks and water control structures. We also oversee the management of two mitigation banks that are a public-private partnership where private entity restores the lands for us and sells a mitigation credit from which the district receives a share of the revenue. This can be a large amount of money. And for example, the Loxahatchee Mitigation Bank has generated over $13 million in gross revenue to the district through the sale of mitigation credits. We also are responsible for managing what are referred to as interim lands. These lands were acquired for a water, res water resource project such as an STA, FEB, or reservoir but where the project has not yet been constructed. Activities on these lands are generally custodial, such as site security, maintaining the surface water system and drainage, addressing dumping issues, and preventing unauthorized uses such as farming or encroachment from adjacent landowners. Our section also budgets for law enforcement services and works closely with the district's law enforcement specialists on enforcement of state and federal rules and regulations and the district's 40E7 public use rules on district managed lands. This is accomplished by using both contracted FWC officers and non-contracted law enforcement officers to patrol district lands for research protection purposes and to ensure that the public has provided a safe environment while recreating on district lands. Contracted law enforcement services include scheduling regular patrols during high public use periods and special details to address some of our more problematic issues such as off-road vehicles in wetlands or illegal dumping and uh, unauthorized hunting. The land stewardship section is involved in habitat and hydrologic restoration projects such as the Sam Jones Abiyaki Prairie, also known as C-139. This 7,000 acre restoration project will restore a former citrus grove back to a natural wetland habitat. 
This restoration project will have significant wetlands and water resource benefits and is funded by the Lake Belt miners as mitigation for their mining activities in Miami-Dade County. And you can see in these photos on the bottom here, that's from C-139. After the stretcher trees were removed here in the lower left, the area was regraded, keeping the historic microtopography, and then planted with what we call the base coat of maiden cane. And just six short months later, you can clearly see that the plantings have taken and the wetland is already beginning to reestablish. Another function of the land stewardship program is to support the district's leasing program, as Stephen mentioned before. Primarily cattle grazing leases, but also including sugarcane, citrus, and row crops on intern project lands. Benefits of cattle grazing include increased presence of property, increased presence on the property, which provides a level of security. Um, it assists in controlling the growth of grasses and other herbaceous vegetation and generates revenue for the district. The land stewardship section provides support to the real estate leasing section by evaluating the properties for cattle grazing suitability. We, input, we provide input to leasing documents, provide technical and logistical support. We serve as a point of contact for field activities and operations and conduct monitoring on 76 leases encompassing over 96,000 acres of district lands. Management of public use is carried out in accordance with the state that directs the district to open its lands for recreational uses to the greatest extent possible, provided these uses are consistent with the purposes for which they were acquired. That's a mouthful. So, but I can tell you that um, recreation on district lands is incredibly popular. Um, some of the many activities include hiking, biking, camping, and horseback riding. These recreational opportunities are provided on a variety of um, different types of lands, uh, project lands, rights of way, and vacant lands. And uh, they're very well used by the public with over 392,000 user days of recreation on the district last year alone. The public can access these lands through 70 parking areas and trailheads, can camp at 52 designated camping areas free of charge, use popular equestrian campgrounds located at the Dupuis management area, and hike more than 350 miles of trails, not including the thousands of miles of rights of way open for trail use. We even have three major boat ramps with paved parking and bathroom facilities. Of course, a lot of the recreation provided on district lands could not be possible without the strong partnership we have with other agencies and organizations, such as the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the Audubon Society, the Florida Trail Association, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and local governments. Volunteerism is an important part of partnering that supports the district's recreation program. And we do have a very active volunteer program. In fact, last year, we received 9,708 volunteer hours of service with a recognized value of over $200,000. Our volunteers provide a wide variety of services, including trail maintenance, public outreach, environmental cleanups, and serving as campground hosts. We also have some of the most popular hunting and fishing areas in the entire state. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission manages, manages 11 management areas, 10 public small game hunting areas, including opportunities within the STAs, and we're honored, and we're honored to work with several veterans and youth groups to provide specialty hunting experiences. So to properly plan for and develop all these public use opportunities on the district lands, we host recreation forum meetings that are held quarterly from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. These meetings are well received by the public and are great opportunities to seek stakeholder input in the planning and administration of recreational use activities on district lands. Our next meeting is scheduled for June 15th via Zoom and you can find out more information at the district's website. Thank you. So in a few short minutes, we've taken you through the care of real estate from the time it's just an idea in our mind until the time it reaches its final use. And with that, we'd be glad to take any questions.
Uh, we have a couple of section administrators available with us to answer any questions that you may have. And thank you for giving us the time to make this presentation. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you very much, Rory. It's amazing that we have 1.5 million acres of land that we get to manage. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big job. So I'd love to turn it over to the uh, governing board now. If you have any questions uh, for anyone on staff about our land and the way we manage it, um, I'd love to have you do that first, and then we'll go into a public comment. If any board member has a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Let's see. <clears throat> Mr. Bergeron, hey, I hear you. Would you like to make a comment? I think that was Mr. Martinez. Oh, Mr. Martinez, sorry. Can you see oh, their hands? I couldn't see the hands. I'm sorry, Mr. Martinez, go ahead. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two quick questions to um, either Rory or Stephen, whichever. Um, Stephen, I, I believe at the beginning of the presentation, you you commented uh, that when we acquire uh, land, the environmental assessment during the due diligence period that we do, um, that it's done in-house, so we don't contract that out. Is, did I understand that correctly? Yes, sir. We do the phase one desktop assessment in-house. And uh, depending on the results of the phase one desktop assessment, we'll, we will go out and do site investigations or hire a contractor to do detailed site investigations and or remediation as necessary. Okay. And, and so the phase one assessment is we do it regardless of... Um, the size of the purchase of, of, of the property. And I guess my, my question is, um, uh, has, it, has it ever been a problem? It seems, um, I mean, obviously during these environmental assessments, it's, it's, it's always possible to miss something. Um, and, and so if we do it in-house, we're stuck with it. If we outsource it uh, to one of these companies that, that do this, at least, um, you know, we, we have, uh, we can, we can go to them for, um, the, fixing the problem. Has that ever, so has it ever been an issue? Well, I'm not aware of us having any issues, but, you know, we do, we do acquire large sites. Um, you know, the, the phase ones that we do in-house are essentially what I call them a desktop. It's a, it's a record right, review, right. it's an aerial review. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's always possible that on a large site you could miss something, but I don't think we've come across anything that we have missed that we didn't know of in advance. Okay. But definitely if something does come up, then the phase two or any subsequent, subsequent, um, environmental assessment, then we would turn it over to uh, and outsource it. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and the second question, I think this one's more to Rory. Rory, you mentioned, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the canals uh, and the embankments. Um, how challenging is it uh, when it comes to the maintenance of the actual embankment? Um, you know, you have Many of these, many of our canals are obviously back up to homes and uh, from time to time we deal with, with erosion on these bank canals. When, uh, you know, how, how does the ditch district determine if I'm a homeowner and I call and I say, hey, um, my home backs up to, to your canal where you have a right of way or you have, a, you have an easement, um, and, and, and this embankment is, is just um, really eroded. Um, at, at what point is, is, it, is it our responsibility uh, to maintain the integrity of that embankment, even though we don't own the property? Well, specific to Miami-Dade County, we have pretty good uh, ownership and right of way. Um, and there are times where we have gone in 
and restabilize bank. But um, a lot of the work that we're doing right now is to address the impacts from hazardous trees and not from erosion. We still have adequate conveyance through our canal system in Miami-Dade and uh, Broward County. Um, even though there is some sloughing of uh, some of the, the banks, access is one of our biggest challenges. Um, and that's why a lot of the work is done um, by water. But the, the erosion that you brought up, uh, we, we deal with that at a case by case basis and to determine if that erosion is impacting our ability to convey water. Okay. So yeah, Mr. Martinez, this is John Mitnick. I'll jump in from the operations and engineering side of the question. Um, Rory is correct. Um, so I'll separate the word embankment because when I hear embankment, I think of a levee. So if there's a levee that's eroding, that's an entirely different issue. But if we're just talking about a canal bank, um, similar to what you see down there in Miami-Dade County, where the, the side of the bank is sloughing off and eroding away. We handle it in a very similar fashion to what Rory just described in the sense that we view it from the canal conveyance perspective first as the priority to maintain flood control and flood protection. And if that canal conveyance is not being hindered due to that sloughing or that erosion um, that's not to say we're not going to address it. It just puts it in a different category you know, as far as a priority is concerned. And we have a program that will that is currently going through all of our canals, all 2000 plus miles of them and looking at those kinds of issues and wherever that priority shakes out on that list is dictates when we start getting around to do some of those bank erosion repairs that are not impacting flood protection and canal conveyance. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Martinez. Uh, Colonel Roman, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank staff for the excellent presentations that, that we received uh, as part of this workshop. My question has to do with um, the first presentation, and that would be yours, uh, Stephen. I'd like to understand the relationship between our leases and our total acreage. Are you saying on slide eight that the 96,000 acreage acres that we have in leases is related to just our acres owned in fee simple, the 803,000? or to the total land controlled, uh, which is about one and a half million? It relates just to the land that we own. In, the, in, uh, fee, in, in fee, fee simple. simple. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, so when I look at this, um, we own roughly, you know, let's say 803,000 uh, acres in fee simple. And we only have, leases for roughly right around 12%. Uh, my question is, are there opportunities to explore um, additional leases on some of this land? And do you wait for, uh, and how do you go about doing it? Do you wait for a landowner to come in and ask or do we aggressively seek out opportunities to lease the land? That's my question, thank you. I would say that we look proactively to lease for leasing opportunities. You know, a lot of our land is not suitable for leasing. It's, you know, water conservation areas aren't suitable for leasing um, and they make up a large portion of our land holdings. Um, of course, the reservoirs don't make, don't make for good land leasing opportunities. And there are some land leasing opportunities that based on the type of use, we don't feel that they would be simpatico with our existing land requirements. But we do look for them and we do respond to, we also do respond to landowners when they make inquiries about leasing. We evaluate their request. Well, with, with that in consideration, 
do we have a total acreage figure of what we think might be um, available for leasing? Uh, no, I don't have an exact number, but I could come up with one. Uh, or just a, an, an estimate, because obviously 803,000 doesn't, doesn't reflect the actual um, availability of those acres for leasing. It just seems but, that 12% is a low number. But I, what I would do, Ms. Roman, this is Drew, is go to slide 13. Okay. And then you, can, then you can see sort of the breakdown of why it's a 12%. Um, so the natural lands that would generally, what we lease is lands that are sort of getting ready to be a project. Um, and so the water conservation areas, we wouldn't lease. Those that are used as FEBs, we wouldn't lease. lease. The STAs, we wouldn't lease unless it's one west, uh, STA one west expansion number two, which I think is under lease. And then SERP reservoirs, of course, we have the lease uh, for the EAA reservoir uh, that's there. And then we have leases for the uh, St. Lucie reservoir, C2324. So you could see a fraction there and a fraction of other lands. We wouldn't lease rights away land or water conservation area lands. And for the, I'm not sure of the breakdown of natural lands, but the vast majority of those we would not lease either. Uh, so, as, it per, as it pertains to natural lands, we we have about 125,000 acres that are part of state parks or forests. We have another 115,000 acres that um, would be marginally le leasable. And examples of that are the crew area. You know, I don't know. There'd be a lot of leasing opportunities in crew, and the eight and a half square mile area, and the southern glades area. Would would you? So you're saying that this 12% figure is higher and there may be limited additional leasing opportunities? Is it, do I understand you correctly, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I think you ask a very interesting question and I think it's a good analysis that we should go through to analyze our potentially leasable land and, and as a function of what we're leasing and, and look for more opportunities. I think that's a great idea. Um, and I but, think you're also right in that if you look at what we own and what they're used for, there's, it's not going to be a huge jump in the amount of lands available to lease, but it might, there might be some more opportunities. Uh, uh, thanks for clarifying that so that, so that I understood better that the 12% figure may not be reflective once you start eliminating what is actually leasable. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for that information. And I, I just think that there may be some opportunities that we're not taking advantage of. And I know that the uh, cattle grazing is a topic that, that comes up often when I'm out in the field uh, visiting the area. So uh, we've had this conversation before, but it's great to see the numbers here on this. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, uh, Colonel Roman. Ms. Thrillipich. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Collins, please. Uh, also based on slide eight to begin with, um, looking at the total acreage at approximately 96,000, is that all 100% uh, to go towards Everglades restoration? Um, I would say generally yes, and there's some of it that is that is conservation lands. I don't know if you'd consider that part of Everglades restoration, but if you consider conservation lands part of Everglades restoration, I would say yes. Thank you. And I imagine that some of these lands were expected to be turned into uh, projects sooner than the number of years they've been leased is is that have some or some of these lands you know since 2000 or when were most of them acquired well they've been they've been acquired over a long period of time but your general presumption that some of these lands have been held longer than initially planned is probably correct um looking at the types uh, cattle grazing, citrus, row crop, sugarcane, miscellaneous mining. Um, I'm, I, I believe that the cattle grazing 
uh, people have been told that they are not to fertilize or use uh, chemicals on plants uh, that are invasive. And I appreciate that. At the same time, I could see how if you're not uh, managing the plants, particularly those lands can go downhill really fast. So I wondered about your, um, about the policy on that. And also I wondered if the citrus people were told they can't use fertilizer uh, and pesticides, the row crop people and the sugar cane people, how are we being um, fair? Thank you. Sure. Well, you know, the um, cattle grazing is considered on a, on a, lease, on a case by case basis. The um, leases uh, don't allow for the application of fertilizer without prior written approval. And the prior written approval is based on a soil test justifying the need for the, the uh, additive or the fertilizer. Uh, with herbicide, um, we haven't always said no to herbicide, but we have said no to selective herbicides based on label labeling and uh, lack of experience or background information on them. Um, but we have approved the use of herbicides on the property. Uh, with respect to citrus, I believe we have placed the same restrictions on citrus as we have on everybody else on, on cattle grazing. Does the district um, have the ability, the people power to go in and look at some of those lands sometime to see how they appear and what kind of, uh, you know, uh, progress or lack of progress is being made with the invasive plants or is, is that just too difficult? We, we, we inspect all of our leases a minimum of two times a year during which time we, you know, we gladly would review with uh, our tenants any issues they have that pertain to exotic control. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm just gonna ask, um, you might not know off the top of your head, but just looking at the cattle grazing, if there's 43 uh, contracts, how many of those are not allowed, I don't like that word, I sound like a teacher again, but I mean, how, how many, uh, based on their soil test, are able to use f nitrogen or fertilizer and how many are not? Well, to try to answer that question, um, I have to first caveat it by saying that not all 43 have applied for fertilizer application is probably less than 10% of our contracts have applied for fertilizer application. And uh, I, uh, we have in prior times allowed application of nitrogen. I appreciate you know, we, that insight. Prior to our board, was it pretty much an understood you that um, cattle, cattle requesting based on their soil science test uh, could use fertilizer? Are you all being, um, you know, following board um, direction? I don't know if we ever gave total direction, but has it become harder for some um, people in the industry because of uh, people like me being concerned about uh, the algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee? Could you just openly talk about that a bit, please? I'd say we're more focused on water quality than we have been in the past because of the governor's directives and the public outcry. Well, I appreciate that. And um, I, I know it is difficult for some people um, trying to do their best business. And um, I look forward over, over time to more of these lands being uh, used for Everglades restoration. And, Thank you for a, a job well done and uh, all of your staff's work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lippish. You know, we do allow the uh, cattle grazing leases to be adjusted downward if they feel like the land cannot support the number of cattle that's initially awarded. So in situations where we don't approve the use of fertilizer, if they feel that that affects their carrying capacity of their land, we do allow them to reduce their leases. 
Thank you so much. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Olivich. Mr. Bergeron. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I, I would first like to thank our staff for such a great presentation here. And, and I'm really uh, believe that a lot of the lands that we're letting the public utilize for recreational purposes, whether it's hunting, fishing, bird watching, uh, hiking, biking, uh, uh, that's a, a true benefit to the outdoor experience uh, for South Florida and uh, Floridians. Um, I had one other, couple other questions. One is uh, you, you said earlier that if agriculture is used on some of our properties for over five years, uh, it lowers the, uh, any wetland Mitigation, that was uh, one of my questions. If you can answer that, and then I have one or two more. Let me try to clarify that response, Mr. Bergeron. If, mm -hmm. if, if lands are left unattended for five years that were formerly agricultural and the, and the emergence of wetland vegetation occurs during that period of time, they can be considered jurisdictional wetlands and require mitigation at time of construction. Okay. Uh, out of the total amount of acreage, uh, do you have a breakdown of what has been land we have that's under SERP for Everglades restoration and uh, and I guess a certain percentage is, uh, that we bought is uh, conservation land to be uh, preserved. Yes, sir. I, you know I don't have that, that breakdown, but I could get it for you. Well, yeah, it's, it's on page uh, slide 13, Mr. Bergeron. I don't know if you, you can thumb through the reserve, uh, presentation. There oh, it okay. is. It's on the screen. And so there you have yeah. your your breakdown of natural lands, and there's there's your SERP reservoirs, thirty four thousand, and then you mm -hmm. got your conservation areas at two hundred fifty four thousand. Right. Well, this land that we have outside of uh, for conservation purposes, uh, could it be? You, you had mentioned earlier that we had uh, several wetland banks where we got substantial revenue. Uh, would it be uh, something we should look into on our conservation land? I know a lot of it that we bought uh, was altered over time uh, in regards to a possible uh, wetland credit uplift to create revenue uh, for our agency and for future projects and Everglades restoration. Uh, some of this conservation land is, could be uplifted uh, and could generate uh, credits. Uh, is that a, a possibility? Uh, yes, I believe that's a possibility. And I think there's some preliminary work being done on that as we speak. Yeah. Well, that would put it back in its natural state uh, for conservation, preservation, um, with access to the public, and at the same time create revenue uh, for future projects uh, to protect and uh, the Everglades. So I'd like us to try to continue to work in that direction. And um, that's all the questions I have right now. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Steinley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Jay Steinley. Uh, Rory, I'm just going to the vegetation management section, and I think it's uh, page 26, which shows the, the maintenance control uh, trajectory of, of uh, herbicide application. So I just want to note this. Um, I think it's 26. I, I, I just want to note that we had a... Um, Sorry, let me just make sure our pages are the same. 
next page, maybe. Is okay. That, is that I'm just, bar chart? I'm looking at one that says maintenance controls the goal. You have a downward sloping red line. Uh, I think my page numbers are off a bit. Um, but but anyways, not not that that could show it too. So so um, I want to note that we had uh, rack um, last week or the week before had a discussion uh, of herbicide application, you know, and 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 everybody on the board and, and the public knows that there's been a significant concern at the voiced um, uh, statewide around the the health, the potential health impacts, and certainly the downstream environmental impacts of, of herbicide application. So I want to I want to acknowledge the the significant um, accomplishments that uh, that district staff has made on reducing um, the amount of uh, herbicide use and and um, coming up with more efficient, safer ways uh, to use uh, it in the future. So I, I think if I recall the numbers correctly, there's been a 60 to 70% reduction of herbicide use for, by the district with another 15 to 20% um, planned. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I guess one of the, one of the things I'm interested in, because you're going through the, the, the land that the district controls, has, has anybody seen, and, and, and you might not know this immediately, but if there's anybody on the line, has anybody seen the same type of trajectory and accomplishment from some of our um, uh, up peer agencies. So, if I if I understand correctly, FWC uh, is obviously an active um, uh, is very active in vegetation management, whereby herbicide is one uh, one component of their toolbox. Have we seen other state agencies make the same progress around? Um, uh, reducing herbicide use as a part of that uh, 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 vegetation management uh, toolbox. Thank you, Mr. Seinle. It's a very good question. Um, well, I can't provide you a specific number right now on uh, where FWC or our partner agencies are at with uh, their strategies. I know that we work very carefully with and closely with FWC, the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and others on um, evaluating how we manage invasive species. So as you know, FWC has spent the last few years uh, reevaluating their program, uh, seeking stakeholder input. And uh, we're currently working with FWC on Lake Okeechobee uh, on a, on a uh, mechanical remove project. We have uh, machines out there working with FWC uh, to see how effective and efficiently we can remove aquatic plants from Lake Okeechobee. But I can provide you those specific numbers and trends from our partnering agencies at a later time. Thanks, Rory. Uh, thanks, Mr. Stanley. Um, I've got a couple questions. Um, first, for Mr. Collins, you referenced a lease length and you said they were from five to 10 years. Is there a standard on our lease length? standard lease for conservation lands is 10 years. The standard lease for project lands is five years. Okay. That's the, the differentiation. Thank you. Um, and here's, a, it might seem like an odd question, but if someone were to want to sell us land, and I've had a couple of people since I've been on the governing board ask me, who would they contact and how, what would your determination be on whether you would purchase land from them or whether we would well, they could, they, could, they could contact me or any member of the real estate staff and we would take a look at the land and we would, we would work closely with Everglades policy and coordination to see if there's a need for the land and what the time frame and the type of need is and we'd get back to them. We routinely get inquiries about uh, our desire to acquire land. Great, um, thank you, um, Stephen. Um, Rory, uh, congratulations yesterday, I know you, you or not you, but uh, Cowboy took out a 100 pound plus Python of the Everglades. That was, I think congratulations are in order. That was a big one. Um, yeah, so that's, that project's going well and I'm, I'm happy to see that. Um, on a different note, you mentioned fire um, is a management tool, but you didn't mention it so much as a management tool for the exotic vegetation. I'm wondering if it is, is it part of that as well or not? 
Yes, uh, prescribed burning is used in conjunction with uh, exotic plant control. Uh, we do implement fire before and after uh, treatment with herbicides. And uh, it has been a very effective way of us uh, managing exotics. It helps us reduce our um, use of herbicides. But with Melaleuca, we'll go in and we'll do an initial treatment of herbicide either on the ground. And if it's really heavily inf infested, we can do it by air if needed. Uh, and then we can follow up with a prescribed burn. So yes, it is used uh, strategically in our IPM pro, uh, program. Great, thank you. And I'd like to echo what Mr. Steinle said and congratulate you on being able to reduce the, uh, the herbicide use that, that the district has been uh, um, engaged in. And I think it's great if we can keep that line moving um, downward and to the right, that's wonderful. Um, I don't see any more questions from board members. Um, Rosie, can we switch over to attendees and go to public comment? Yes, Chairman. Currently, I do not see any hands raised. However, if we can give a second and see if anyone has a question, they can either raise their hand if they're on Zoom or press star nine. If you are participating by phone, that will raise your hand as well. I have one hand raised, it's Nyla Pipes. Good afternoon, everyone, can you hear me? I hear you. Fantastic. I just wanted to weigh in and tell you that I very much appreciated the presentation. I um, think there's a lot of information in there that really draws home how delicate the balance is between being uh, stewards of and owners of the public land and you know the cost of it and and i think that it's really important that we continue to pursue those leases i appreciate um some of the comments made about you know cattle on the land and and how that helps us i think that's a much better management tool than herbicides for instance um where possible i think that it's really important that we um identify some of the areas that we could do better. And I know that that's always a challenge because there is not nearly enough budget ever for the sort of management that we need in the state of Florida for our lands. Um, but I do know, you know, people come to me on a regular basis and they talk about areas where things are taken over and we haven't gotten in there in years. And, um, you know, instances where some of the, and I know this isn't quite in line, but even still, it's, it's still land management. Um, areas where like some of the artesian wells that were capped, the caps have blown off over time and now they're just spewing water and some of those sorts of things. And so I just encourage us to, you know, look carefully at each and every bit of land that we own as South Florida Water Management District and identify some of those areas where we need to do better. Um, in general, I know you guys do the best you can. I also know that your budget is incredibly limited. And I think that these conversations um, with the public listening in, I think they're really important because, you know, there's a, a heartbeat, you know, behind conserving and, and, and buying land, that the idea that it won't be developed. And I think that that's really great and beautiful, but we also have to be conscientious of the need to take care of it. And there are instances where it sometimes makes more sense for the existing land use to continue. So thank you for striking that balance. Let's look at some of those areas um, maybe that we could do better and uh, we'll just keep on keeping on. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any more hands raised. Thank you, Rosie. Um, thank you, Ms. Pipes for your comments. Um, and thanks very much to staff for putting this together. I, th I found it very helpful. Um, so thank you, Stephen and Rory. It was a very good presentation. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and adjourn this meeting, but before I do, I'd like to remind you, we have a governing board meeting tomorrow, our monthly business meeting, uh, nine o'clock, same format. We'll be using Zoom. Um, I'm supposed to remind you there's a different link for tomorrow's meeting. So please go to sfwmd.gov slash meetings uh, for more information. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.